I was just getting out of the shower when my cell phone rang. Cursing, I wrapped the towel around me and hurried into the bedroom to grab it from the dresser. Darlene has already left for Christmas shopping, and we plan to meet later at the consultant's office. Before I could say hi, a cheerful male voice said, Hey, Darlene, is there any chance we can meet today for a quickie? I just can't wait two more whole days. I miss you and want to take possession of you as soon as possible. What the hell are you talking about? I said angrily. There was a shuddering sigh, then two or three seconds of complete silence, then a click of shutdown. Stunned, I looked at the phone. What the hell was that? A minute later, I realized it was Darlene's phone, not mine. They were the same model, but I had a crack in the glass of the screen that was missing from the one I was holding in my hand. She must have grabbed the wrong phone on the way out the door. But who would call her looking for sex anyway? Jesus Christ, was she really having sex on the side? It looked exactly like this. Stunned, I hung up, went back to the bathroom and dried myself off, my thoughts racing. All I could think was, this can't be true. Darlene and I have been married for six years. We don't have children by mutual agreement, and the last few months have been pretty rough. We still got along and she still loved me, of course. But her interest in sex had all but disappeared. From two or three times a week, sometimes at least on her initiative, we cut back to once or twice a month and even then, only at my insistence. And when we had sex, she was passive and unenthusiastic rather than the passionate and enthusiastic partner she was at the beginning of our marriage. We talked about the problem again and again. Darlene kept telling me it wasn't anything special, she was just tired and overly busy at work. Except that nothing has changed at her job, no big projects, no terrible deadlines, no promotions. Every time I talked about it, Darlene replied that she was better and she was ready to make love to me whenever I wanted. Even every night, that night we made love, but everything quickly returned to the same. I beg, she denied. By the end of September, I was sick of it, and in the evening after dinner, I sat her down on the sofa. Darlene, I love you, but I'm not ready to continue in the same spirit. I don't want to live the rest of my life without sex. You used to love having sex with me, but now you obviously don't anymore. Something has to change, or I'll file for divorce. She looked at me, completely stunned. Divorce? Lord dear. Isn't this too radical? Darlene, do you know how bad this is? I decided to find out. In the last three months, we had three quick sex sessions, plus one lovemaking session. Only four times since the first of July. And during this time, you refused me 18 times. I'm not going to live like this anymore. She looked down at her feet, obviously feeling very uncomfortable. Baby, I'm sorry. You know I love you, and I can and will be better, I promise. I'm just so tired, sorry. It's not enough, Darlene. I want two promises from you, or I'll go to a lawyer on Monday. She looked at me cautiously, and I continued. First, I want you to see Dr. Evans and get a full examination to make sure there is no physical problem. And secondly, I want us to start seeing a marriage counselor. Marriage consultant? But nothing bad happened to us. No, it happened. Are you listening to me, Darlene? We live together almost like brother and sister. Whether you want to admit it or not, something has really gone wrong, and we either try to fix it or I'm leaving. A long argument followed, full of Darlene's tears, but I was adamant, and in the end, I got my way. She met with Dr. Evans, who confirmed her full health, and we started meeting once a week with Eileen Archer, a consultant recommended by our friends Brad and Allison, who had worked with her a couple of years ago. We consulted for about two months and everything was going well, or at least I thought so. We talked a lot about our relationships, about each of our jobs, about the families we grew up in, and what our parents' marriages were like. Some of them seemed boring or out of place, but Eileen was confident that we were making progress even if it didn't make life in our bedroom any better. Until now, we haven't talked more about sex, but about relationships and how we got out of bed. Eileen's slogan for me was, be patient, and for both of us, be honest with yourself and your partner. Now, 
standing in the bedroom, staring at Darlene's phone as if there was a snake crawling out of it. I had to think. Did I just discover the real reason why she didn't want to have sex with me anymore? It was that simple. Was I replaced? Is anyone else stepping in and playing the role of the traditional husband? As far as I could see, nothing had changed in Darlene's schedule. She no longer worked late, went on mysterious shopping trips or dates with girls, or came home flushed and disheveled and ran straight to the shower. But that didn't mean she didn't have sex with some asshole. She just did it with caution. I took her phone and checked the calls I had received, and to my surprise there was only one call, the one I had just answered. The caller was identified as CM. I pressed answer and waited for the beeps to start ringing. Unsurprisingly, the guy didn't dare pick up the phone, and the call went to voicemail. This is Chris Mason. Leave a message and I will call you back. Have a good day. I hung up. I recognized the name. He was another employee at the brokerage firm where Darlene worked, but in some other division. She mentioned him to me once or twice, but I never met him. I checked Darlene's phone more thoroughly. Not only all previous received calls were deleted, but also the lists of missed and sent calls. Who needed to spend time removing all this? Darlene was clearly covering her tracks. I headed into the office, looking for my cell phone and home phone records for the past few months. Darlene paid the bills, so I never had any reason to look for them. In the desk, I found all the bills for our home phone, but a search turned up no calls from Chris Mason, or at least from his cell phone. But cell phone records were missing for the past eight months. I looked in the checkbook, and all the cell phone bills had been paid, so Darlene must have hidden or thrown away the receipts, no doubt because they included calls to Chris Mason. I arrived at Eileen's office about 20 minutes early. Darlene's car wasn't in the lot yet, so I sat down and thought for a moment. If I was right, if Darlene cheated on me with Chris Mason or someone else, our marriage was over. She may love me, but it's not worth a damn if she sleeps with anyone else. I guess she loved me. Otherwise, why would she want to stay together? Why bother seeing a consultant and also appear to be lying to both the consultant and me? But if she thought that she could sit comfortably on two chairs, then I will not agree with this. And in general, she will have to find out that she is completely wrong. I thought first of meeting Darlene in Eileen's office today, sharing the contents of the call from Chris and demanding an explanation. But I realized that this is not enough for me. I wanted proof, and then I wanted to spectacularly end our marriage by wiping Darlene's nose. I was angry and hurt, and she had to pay for what she did to me. And I knew the best place for our final confrontation would be Eileen's office. So I went inside, and after a while, Darlene appeared, kissed me, and we went to our meeting. Eileen got us talking about the usual bullshit, how we handled arguments in our relationship, and whether the differences in styles were based on our experiences and how our parents argued and all sorts of stuff. I played along, looked thoughtful and serious, tried to give plausible answers, and tried not to grind my teeth too much. This damn bitch. I wanted to grab her by the throat and strangle her right in front of Eileen. Towards the end of the session, Eileen gave me the chance to get one good reason to tease Eileen, not too much, but just a little. She said something like, I know this is hard for both of you, but gradually we learn about your marriage, about the expectations each of you have for it, and your honesty actually helps create an atmosphere in which we can move the conversation from general to productive discussion, also about your sexual problems. I intervened to say, Thank you for saying that, Eileen. Sometimes it was difficult for me, but I tried to be completely honest and frank. It seems that this is the only way to achieve anything. Darlene, would you say that this is true for you as well? I watched her as she blushed slightly and avoided my eyes. Instead, she looked at Eileen, nodded and said, Absolutely, Alan. I feel the same way. I wonder if Eileen noticed Darlene's obvious discomfort. She didn't comment but I thought she looked at Darlene intently for a moment or two. After the session, we walked across the street to the diner for a quick lunch. When she went to the ladies' room, I quickly took my cell phone out of her purse and put it in my pocket. I then went outside to buy a newspaper from the vending machine, and while there, I turned off Darlene's phone, wrapped it in newspaper, and put it in the bottom of the trash can. 
I thought Chris Mason would be madly trying to contact Darlene to let her know what had happened, so I was going to make sure he had no chance of getting to her. During lunch, Darlene and I chatted about nothing, mostly about her shopping and what gifts we'd still need the next day when we were going to her parents' house for Christmas dinner. We made a list of what we needed and then headed to a row of crowded stores to buy the last few things. I was amazed at my ability to keep my mouth shut, to pretend to be nice when all I wanted to do was hit her. But either I was a better actor than I thought, or Darlene was too distracted, but she did not notice that anything was wrong. At home during dinner, the corded phone rang three times, and each time I jumped up to answer it. The first two were just silence. The third time, about twenty minutes later, a female voice that I had never heard before asked, Can I talk to Darlene, please? I wondered what if Chris, in desperation, hired some friend to give Darlene a message from him and said, Can I find out who is calling? The voice answered, This is Iris, from work. Smiling to myself, I said, What happened, can I tell you? She was at a dead end. There was a short silence, and then she said, Oh, it's for work. Well, there's an account we're both working on, and I have a couple of questions about it. On Christmas Eve? I said, I'm afraid she won't be able to answer the phone now, but I'll definitely give her a message. Good evening. And I hung up the phone with a smile. Darlene looked at me questioningly when I returned, and I said, Some lady is conducting a survey. Can you believe them calling on Christmas Eve? I could tell Darlene was a little worried. She waited a few minutes, then casually walked into the other room, no doubt checking her cell phone. She returned with her purse and looked worried. Dear, do you know where my mobile phone might be? I remember taking it from the dresser when I left this morning. Gee, Darlene, I have no idea. Is it not in your bag? Have you looked near your car, or maybe you left it somewhere in a shopping center? She went and searched the car, but to no avail and I sat there and smiled. She finally gave in, and I promised to give her a new one as a New Year's gift. Don't count on it, darling, I thought to myself. I'm sure her next step would be to try calling Chris if she could get rid of me for just a few minutes. Several times during the evening, I noticed Darlene watching me out of the corner of my eye. I wonder if she's hoping for a chance to get to the phone. Finally, she said, Honey, I'm a little tired. I'll go upstairs and just want to watch TV for a while, okay? Of course, Darlene, I replied. Actually, that sounds great. I'll just put the dishes in the sink and let's go together. She smiled at me, but I could see that she was annoyed. An hour later, she asked me to check if there were trash cans on the side of the road. Then I reminded her that tomorrow was Christmas and they shouldn't be there. She turned away from me with obvious disappointment. When we went to bed, she had no way to call anyone. I got up early on Christmas morning, ate breakfast while Darlene slept, and did a few preparations. Then he went into the bedroom and gently woke her. Good morning, dear Merry Christmas. I gave her a fake smile. Coffee is ready in the kitchen. I'm leaving. See you later at your parents' house. She sat down awkwardly. It's only 8.30, Alan. Where are you going? I smiled again. I need to pick up a last-minute gift for you, my dear. But don't worry, I'll see you there at two. She protested, saying, Weren't all the shops closed today? And can't I then go home and pick her up? But I was already heading towards the door, blowing her a kiss. At 8.45, I knocked on Chris Mason's apartment door, having found his address in Darlene's office directory. I figured he'd be in town today since he mentioned he was looking forward to seeing Darlene the next day. When he opened the door, he was wearing a robe and looked sleepy. A tall, good-looking guy, about twenty-five or so. Yes. What do you want? What the hell? He stopped talking and retreated into his living room as I walked in and quickly closed the door behind me. I held a Hammerly 208 air pistol in my hands, aimed directly at his chest. It wasn't much of a lethal weapon, just something I used for short-range practice, but Mason clearly didn't know that. He looked absolutely terrified. Let me introduce myself, Chris. I am Alan Rohatton, Darlene's husband and your current sexual partner. His eyes widened and he took another step back. Hey, guy, calm down, okay? I don't know what you... In short, Chris, yesterday you called asking for a quickie with my wife. Do you really think I can't understand what's going on? Now this is what will happen. We'll sit here in your living room and have a nice chat. 
If I don't get the answers I need, I'll shoot you once or twice in the groin and leave you to bleed. If you decide to be more reasonable and responsive, then after a while, we will visit my friends and talk with them. And then perhaps I will leave you alone and you will continue to live your life. Understood? He looked at me cautiously and nodded his head slightly. All I have to do is talk to you? I nodded. Yeah, and I'll leave you alone. Damn, it's bad if you don't agree to cooperate with me, and then I'll be forced to shoot you, and I don't want to do that. Especially since you don't want that either, do you, Chris? Chris and I chatted for a bit, and he told me everything I wanted to know. I then supervised him as he took out his clothes and took them into the bathroom to shower and get dressed. After that, he made us sandwiches in his kitchen and we ate. I kept the gun pointed at him the whole time. We didn't talk much, but it was good for me. At 1.45, we went out and got into my car. I gave Chris the address and told him to drive while I sat in the back seat with a gun in my hand. When we got to Darlene's parents' house, I told Chris to park four doors away so they couldn't see my car. I noticed that Darlene's car was already there, along with the car that belonged to her sister Barbara and her husband. But I wanted to make an impressive entrance, so we sat and waited until 2.30 before I pulled Chris out of the car and walked him to their driveway. No more games now, okay, Chris? I ordered. Do you remember the agreement? We walk in. I make some opening statements. You tell your story, and I leave. And you save your life and maintain your health. My gun will be in my pocket, but it will appear in less than one second if you want to do some shit to me. He looked pale, as if he was uneasy, and his eyes looked with wild horror. Don't worry, dude. I'll play everything the way you said. When we rang the doorbell, Darlene's mom, Sarah, answered. Her welcoming smile turned into one of confusion when she saw Chris. Hello, Alan. Who is this? Hi, Sarah. Merry Christmas, I said, kissing her cheek as we entered the foyer. This is Chris. He's only here for a few minutes. Ignoring her confusion, I took Chris by the hand and led him straight into the dining room, where the family was just about to start eating. Apparently, they were going to start without me. Merry Christmas, everyone, I said with a joyful smile, looking at the surprised faces. Darlene's father, Tom, sat there, and her sister, Barbara, with her husband, Mark, and their two boys, Teddy and Ben, and then sat Darlene. Everyone else had a vague but pleasant, even anticipatory expression on their faces. What a pleasant surprise, they thought, an extra guest. But Darlene looked as pale as a ghost. Her mouth opened a couple of centimeters and I thought she might faint. Attention, everyone. This is Chris. He's Darlene's colleague and he has a little story to tell us. Come on, Chris. Darlene rose to her feet. No, Alan, it's not what you think. I quickly interrupted her. It's okay, Darlene. I think everyone should hear this. She took a few quick steps towards the door, but I grabbed her hand and hugged her tightly. Come on, Chris. Darlene tried to free herself from me by saying, No, no, Chris, don't. I placed my free hand over her mouth to silence her as her parents watched in complete amazement. Chris reluctantly began to speak. Darlene and I had an affair. This started in April and is still ongoing. Darlene's family gasped, then stared at Chris, then at Darlene and me. After a long pause, Barbara lifted Teddy and Ben from their chairs and pushed them into the living room, where she turned on the TV, then returned and closed the door behind her. Keep going, Chris, I smiled. We met at work. The fitness center has several massage rooms whose doors can be locked. We did this about twice a week, meeting at different times, so no one noticed a pattern. We work on different floors of the building, so no one realized that we were leaving at the same time. There are showers there, where we then clean ourselves up. Darlene continued to struggle with me. She tried to bite my hand, but I held her tightly. And Chris, I said, what exactly did you two do together? Please be specific. He didn't meet my eyes. We mostly had sex, sometimes quickly. I loved the look of horror on Darlene's mother's face. Darlene stopped fighting me, and I removed my hand from her mouth. She just stood there, tears streaming down her face. And what does it feel like to have sex with my beloved wife? I asked affably. I knew what his answer would be, 
I made him practice it a couple of times to make sure everything went smoothly. She is very hot, passionate, and sexy, always very proactive. She tenses her hips. She is very active. She always helps me. She turns me on and encourages me, especially when she is about to be released. To my surprise, Darlene's relatives still did not move. I expected one of them to try to put an end to this. Has she ever talked about me? I asked. Sometimes. She said that she loves you very much, but she doesn't want to stop having sex with me. She told me many times. When did you plan to meet next time? Tomorrow. She was going to tell you that she needed to work in the office. We planned to be together for about three hours. We were looking forward to having more time this time. She said she was going to have amazing sex with me. She wanted to drive me crazy. She wanted to surprise me so much that my eyes would pop out of my sockets. She wanted to tire me out so much that I wouldn't even be able to walk. How long do you think this romance will last? He said, probably a few more weeks. I would have been happy to continue, but Darlene said it was time to stop. She said you insisted on counseling because your sex life had taken a nosedive and she was worried that you would figure out what was going on. She said that New Year's Day would be the day she broke up with me, but then she laughed and said that it might take her a few weeks to complete everything. There was silence in the room as Darlene's family looked at us in shock. Me, Darlene, Chris, everyone was standing. Darlene sobbed, covering her face with her hands, not trying to say anything. I walked up to Tom, took his hand, and shook him. Bye, Tom. I loved being your son-in-law. You and Sarah are good people, and you deserve better as a daughter than this cheating slut. Of course, I also deserve better for myself as a wife than she did. I went to Sarah, kissed her on the cheek, and said, Bye, Sarah. Sorry. I won't stay for lunch. This might be a little awkward. Darlene fell to the floor. She was still crying, just sitting there and covering her face with her hands. I leaned over and said, Don't come home tonight, Darlene. Your things will be packed outside the garage by tomorrow morning, and I'll change the locks. And don't, I repeat, don't try to talk to me. You won't say anything that I want to hear. She looked at me, lines of dripping mascara crossing her face. Alan, dear, I love you so much. Forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt you. Forgive me, dear. I don't want to lose you and our family. I'm sorry. I said no. Without saying a word, I turned to the table, smiled, and, waving to everyone, headed towards the door. Chris had the good sense not to ask me to give him a ride home.